we're back again. And guess who I've got over here? Take a look. You can see our good friend, Thomas. He's been away almost an entire year. And yet he is, if you've been going up on his site, I'll, I'll, you can see the URL right down here. There is his site. Make sure you go up and see him. Thomas has been working lickety split, unpacking an awful lot of what's coming out of the Inada school. In fact, uh, Thomas, it was because of you that I got in, in touch with uh, Dr. Robert Kerr and uh, now bringing him on board to actually do an awful lot of, uh, quite a few where they're yet to be put up, uh, interviews. But what's fascinating, Thomas, y you're writing a book. I understand you're writing a book actually on the the, the Quran and you, are, uh, you have done, uh, either you've done or you're going to do a chapter on Gunter Luling. And uh, you, in, uh, you introduced yourself again last week and said, listen, this whole thing that people are having problems with, and the problem with Gunther Luing or any of these uh, scholars like Christoph Luxemburg or Salma, Gabriel Salma, what they're doing is they're making, they're saying all these things, but no one is able to actually visually see what they're saying because we don't understand Aramaic, Aramaic and many of us don't read or write Arabic. And for that reason, it's kind of going over our heads. And we're not, the the as we've been looking at the comments on all these different videos where we're putting up Salmo's material. Murad has done a great job of going through chapter 106, 108, uh, 111, 112 especially. Uh, terrific stuff, but where's the Aramaic? What exactly, ha where's the process of taking from Aramaic and putting into Arabic? And what you have suggested is that you're doing that in your book. You're, this is what's going to be published once you get it uh, out into the publishing field. So what I, what you have uh, volunteered to do is today, Take a bit of that chapter that you put together on Guntur Luning, and you're going to zero in on chapter or Surah 96, a very famous chapter. It's not too big, but it, it, it really does include or open up and unpack for us what Guntur Luning is doing, because it's, a, it's not too long a chapter, yet you'll see his methodology probably better than any other place in this chapter. So you understand this better than anybody. You have been reading it in German. You've been following Gunter Luning. You understand where he's going with it. Thank you for coming on board and doing that for us right now. So over to you, uh, our good friend, Ali, uh, Thomas. What exactly is Gunter Luning doing? What is he saying? Help us to understand that by using this example, example Surah 96. Yeah, um, exactly. So first of all, um... What I want to what I know I highlight is I mean obviously a lot of people ask what where are the examples you're always telling us um, about Günther Lüling and what you just said like Christoph Luxberg and so on and but we don't see the examples and the big problem is that on a platform like YouTube or like in in a video format it's very difficult to visualize right because examples typically mean you have to read a lot and it's also part of the reason why I decided to um, sort of start writing this book I mean I've it, it started with actually me doing these videos, right? And I've put together all these references and I've created my notes and I thought, okay, all I have to do is basically turn my notes in the book. It can't be that hard. Uh, well, it was a bit harder than I initially thought. <laughs> so, so I didn't really know what I was getting into there, but um, after working on it for a while and yeah, um, and part of the reason is to make it possible to actually show these examples, which really don't translate well onto a video format. Now, in the case of, um, Günther Lüding. Um, as Chase just said, I want to look at um, Zora 96. That's one of his most famous um, uh, well, work on the Quran um, and how he reinterpreted it. And this is relatively short, so it can really be shown on one screen, right? So it helps to um, make it visual, and I'm, I'm trying to make it as visual as possible. And, well, what Günther Lüding is doing, he's what he's actually doing is he started with um, the realization that you can't really trust the diacritics. Um, before contributing, most scholars, I mean, not, not all of them, but, but most, um, they sort of took those diacritical marks, those dots and squiggles and, and the lines, they took those sort of as gospel, right? This must be the true reading. There's a long um, oral tradition. And Günther Lüding really fundamentally challenged that. Not just, it did just say, well, maybe it's wrong here or there. He says, we can't really trust it at all because it started centuries after the fact. Um, so then he looked, with that in mind, he looked at the Quran and he looked at the Razum form, so just the consonant letters, and he looked at what, what else could there be, could be in there. And what he found are, um, what he found are hymns and, and verse structures um, of a, as he argues, a Christian nature. 
let me just jump yeah. in here and ask a question here. Uh, uh, for many of us who are uninitiated, when you're talking about Razum, you're talking about the text, the consonantal text. These are the 14 to 16 letters that existed. These are the same letters. It existed both in Arabic and in Aramaic. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, That's yes, why you exactly. can find the liaisons. I hope everybody's listening to this. So the same letters that are in Aramaic also exist in Arabic. What changes them are the diacritics. Now, by diacritics, you mean the dots and the vowels. Yes. The five dots yes. and the three vowels in Aramaic. Uh, in Arabic, sorry. How many dots and how many vowels were there in Aramaic? <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know. Have that uh, on top of my head. But okay, but I there were much dots less... and vowels also in Aramaic, much similar to Arabic, that actually delineated which of these let what these letters were. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we've done this before, Thomas. If you look at just one little bowl shape like this, that could be five different letters in Arabic. Exactly. exactly. You put a na, yeah. ta, tha, ba, ya. Three, five different letters, depending on where you put those dots. Those dots did not exist in the seventh century when they were lifting out of the Aramaic and putting it into Arabic. They don't exist on these earliest manuscripts that we have that we are looking at the six major manuscripts those dots there are some dots beginning to be introduced but they could have even been introduced at a later date when they were first written those dots didn't exist in those manuscripts am i correct exactly exactly i mean we do find some primitive um vowel marks for example in some early manuscripts but that's really nowhere near the complexity of of like a modern quran um they don't tell you very much and it, they are not present everywhere they're just in a few manuscripts in a few places so yeah just so um, people know vowels are different yeah. than diacritic than dots exactly yeah explain the difference between the dots and the vowels because there are three so, vowels five dots yeah so the the these dots that differentiate the different consonants um they change yeah, what which letter you're reading there? What you just said. So it could be a yeah, it could be a ta, the same shape. Now a vowel marking tells you where a vowel would go in the word. So you would you never write a vowel in these Semitic languages, not like uh, like it's a, for example in English where you have e or u like as a, a separate letters. These letters don't exist in the Semitic languages. Instead, you have little markings um, which go below uh, or, or be, uh, below or above a a consonant and that's where you then would put in the vowel here i'll, I'll um, put so the three vowels up right here here you can see yeah. a slash above <laughs> is an a a slash below is an e that's a kasra a uh, little curly q above is a u so a e u those are the three vowels and you can see those did not exist in any of these manuscripts when they were first written in arabic Exactly, but there were some in some manuscripts there were primitive versions of those. So like some red dots which indicate a vowel goes here, but it doesn't really then specify which one. Or so even with those primitive ones, it's still very much ambiguous. Okay, so good to learning is taking off those dots, taking off those vowels, and replacing yeah. them with Aramaic dots and Aramaic vowels. Am I correct? Uh, actually, not necessarily Aramaic. So good learning actually didn't assume that he was reading uh, Aramaic words. That was then what Christoph Luxemburg also introduced, or before him also Alphonse uh, Mingana. They actually looked for um, Aramaic words. Lüling assumed he was reading a purely Arabic text, so he didn't actually go that far. He did look for Aramaic cognates. So that is words that sort of sound similar. Um, so if you have two related languages, like Arabic and Aramaic, um, they typically um evolve um uniformly across like all words so if a sound shifts um let's say from r to u, i don't know if that ever happens but let's say it happens and it happens across the board in all words right so now a cognate is where you can we can then apply these um, systematic changes and then come back to the same root right um so it started out with the same root, but then it evolved to two different directions and became two different words. And he, he looked for that to identify the true meaning by going via the Aramaic. But he was still, he wasn't looking specifically for Aramaic words. He was looking for Arabic words that maybe have been lost or forgotten or something. Um, but he viewed them as specifically Aramaic. Um, and then, for instance, later when Christoph Luxemburg came along, he then combined um, this approach of Lüling and then also added this uh, added a search for Aramaic, proper Aramaic words in the Quran. So that's something Gluding himself didn't actually do. 
Okay, that's yeah, that's that's good to that you explain that because most of us have been saying the other. We've been saying that Luling started the process. Christoph Luxemburg just built upon what Luling was saying, but that they were both going back to Ar- Aramaic Christian hymns because uh, that's mm-hmm. what he found these these this poetry were those Christian hymns. Obviously, you're saying that those Christian hymns were also in Arabic before the uh, earlier Arabic, but the words had changed once they put it in later Arabic. Yeah, so exactly. So, I mean, again, L- Luling did go back to the Aramaic, but more to find Arabic, if that makes sense, um, by looking at the, how these languages developed. Um, but yeah, he assumed um, that he was reading proper Arabic. Uh, so that was his his approach. And then um, before him already was, I already mentioned the name, Alphonse Mingana. I think he was the first to systematically look for Aramaic words in the Quran, and then Christoph Luxemburg sort of combined those two approaches, uh, if you will. So he he used part of the methodology of Günther Lüling and some of the insights of Alphonse Mingana, and then he came up with this his revolutionary book. Yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 hearing you correcting. When he went back and found these Christian hymns, yeah, the Christian hymns were written in Aramaic, were they not? Well, he, as I said, he read Arabic in the Quran. So he read Christian hymns in Arabic. He, of course, um, um, uh, or he thought that they go back to Ar- Aramaic or to Aramaic hymns, which were then sort of, I don't know, evolved or trans- were translated into Arabic. But in the Quran himself, he, uh, in the Quran itself, he read he read it as Arabic. Gotcha. So he didn't okay. find actual, actually Aramaic words in there, or he didn't look for Aramaic words. Um, he looked at it from this perspective of the Quran being written in Arabic. Okay, let's go ahead and let's let's start with this example you're going to give to explain it. Okay. Right, so, yeah. As Jay has just mentioned, I have prepared something. So... Don't look too closely. This is just an early draft. Um, I haven't I haven't proofread anything, so there will be some weird phrasings and and stuff. Um, I think Jay, you asked me once regarding uh, the Günther Lüling book, if it's just typically for Günther Lüling to write these long and complicated sentences, or if it's a German thing. And I have to tell you, it is definitely a German thing. So I tried to stay away from it, but I still have like I do need to go over this again. So don't look too closely. The point is now. What did Günther Lüling say? Just so and people know, this start... is from your book. We're looking exactly. At. So this is from my upcoming uh, book. Again, first draft. Um, a lot will change <laughs> still, but but this is where where we are right now. So and obviously, I have a chapter on these hidden hymns in the Quran, and then I, in the process of that, I also look into Günther Lüling's work and give some examples, so that um, yeah, because everybody wants examples, obviously, because you want to know what's in there. Um, so in this case. I want to start with this word here. So this is found in verse 18 of Surah 96. And I'll just read what I've written here. That's, I guess, the easiest way. So this word is pronounced Zabaniya, and nobody knows what it means. It only occurs this once in all of the Quran. Muslim scholars have long agreed that it's probably the name of a celestial being, but even that doesn't really fit into the context of the Surah. That is why most modern translations of the Quran why in most modern translations of the Quran, Zabaniya is translated as angels of hell, whom God calls upon to push the sinners into the eternal fire. Luling, on the other hand, doubts this reading and examines other possible diacritics and how they would change the meaning, potentially making this passage clearer to understand. His proposal is the following reading of the same rasm. And now what we can see here, so this is his, into Luling's proposal, and what we can see is that the, the consonant structure is exactly the same. Right, so in both instances, what changes are only these squiggles and dots and, and, and dashes. But that completely changes the word. Now this reads as Rabbaniya. Luling looks at the Aramaic Bible that is in use by Christians in the Orient during the Middle Ages. There he finds the following word in Mark 10.51 and John 20.16. So this is the Aramaic word, and this is pronounced as Rabuni and is nowadays typically translated as lord or master, sometimes also as teacher. And for example, in this case, Rabuni also has the same root as rabbi, for example. So that's why um, sometimes also translated as teacher. So these languages are all related. 
In any case, the Bible clearly refers to Jesus Christ in this instance. Um, yeah, so I think that's enough for this one. But here we can see like one example of how, how he works. So um, he sees this word, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the Quran or the Arabic language. Um, and was just randomly sort of um, defined, if you will, because the whole context uh, was difficult to understand. Uh, so he finds that this same rasm could be translated as um, yeah, Lord or Master or Teacher, which is, when read in the Aramaic sources, clearly a reference to Jesus Christ. So he argues the same is true here. Um, okay, one other quick example. Now, this is slightly different what he's doing here. So I want to look at this phrase. So this is the beginning of the surah, and it reads, um, Ikra bismi rabika. And this is typically understood to mean read in the name of your Lord. But the same phrase occurs many times in the Quran, and it in all the other instances, it's not understood as read in the name of your Lord. Um, but rather, it's understood as praise the name of your Lord. Or as Gwintolin will argue, it's uh, meant to mean invoke the name of your Lord. Um, here also here, if, if you see with this Rabika, again, the same root as uh, Rabuni in Aramaic or Rabbi. So this is here correctly translated as your Lord uh, in by, by the Arabs, whereas before it wasn't. Um, and here he just, here his approach is just look at where else does this occur in the Quran? Is it translated in the same way? No, it's not here. It's special. Um, okay, so probably it was reinterpreted by the initial um, Quranic exegetes, if you will, because they needed to make sense of this passage, which otherwise wouldn't have made sense. And so now I want to just go straight into the complete Surah 96. So here we have it. Let me try to zoom in a little bit. Okay, so what I've done here is, as you can see, on the left side of the screen, there is the traditional reading uh, of the Quran. On the right side, there's going to Luling's reading. And I've highlighted where they differ. And the so I've highlighted in red. So here is it, or here. So then on the other side, for instance, here is moved uh, this little squiggle from below to above the aleph, um, and thereby changing the meaning and making more sense of it. He also kind of split up the verses slightly differently. So here is the verse number, and then obviously see that verse one, he split up into two lines, um, verse 15 into three lines. We'll get into that in a minute. And as you can see on both sides, again, the rasms are completely identical. So he didn't change any of the letters, only the dots and the squiggles and uh, yeah, the diacritics. So, okay, um, as I said at the beginning, there's no way around reading. So I've, I need, uh, I guess I need to read those one out, ones out, but they are short, so it should be fairly quick. So now the traditional reading of this surah goes, read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a clinging substance. Read and your Lord is the most generous, who taught by the pen, taught man that which he knew not. No, but indeed man transgresses because he sees himself self-sufficient. Indeed, to your Lord is the return. Have you seen the man who prevents a servant when he prays? Have you seen if he is upon guidance or enjoins righteousness? Have you seen if he denies and turns away? Does he not know that Allah sees? No, if he does not desist, we will surely drag him by the forelock, a lying, sinning forelock. Then let him call his associates. We will call the angels of hell. No, do not obey him, but prostrate and draw near to Allah. So, Again, so if already by listening, this doesn't feel like it makes a whole lot of sense. And you do need to definitely need the context of the later traditions to even to even have any idea what this could mean. So right in the later traditions, this is Gabriel talking to Muhammad, telling him um, to read or something to recite in the name of your Lord. But even then, um, this is really an odd surah. I mean, there's no other way of putting it, right? Um, 
you need like for every little bit you need a story explaining it so for example have you seen the man prevents a servant when he prays um there are different stories explaining that um that um that there was some there may have been somebody who prevented muhammad from play of praying or another believer from praying and um but this this context first of all seems to be a bit arbitrary and it's without it it makes fairly little sense now what Günther Lüling did as we just said is he he changed these little diacritics um in some places and he changed and he split up some of the verses and then what he ended up with is not only in the um, doesn't just read like a hymn it also rhymes and I think that's really what uh what is sort of the clinch I mean it, it his reading makes more sense than the traditional one he he says we don't need all this later context this these um stories from the sunnah and the sira um to explain this. So the only context we need is something that came before the Quran, not after, and that is um, the Christian tradition, the Bible, and and the hymns that were written about it. So this is the same context we have to look at. We have to, uh, yeah, we have to take to understand this this surah. And then we have this, and then we see this beautiful hymn. And uh, he did it without changing the rhythm. He found rhymes in it, and not only did it rhyme, it, it uh, he has these three line verses and uh, constantly throughout the whole surah there are three line verses and they are they're all the words in the end they rhyme like in for, for all the three lines so this can't be a coincidence okay so what does he now read um let me let me read what Günther Lüling found here invoke in the name of your lord who created created man from clay invoke for thy lord is the most generous who taught by the writing cane taught man what he didn't know not at all that man shall be presumptuous when he, whenever he sees him overbearingly independent. Behold, to God is the recourse. Have you ever seen that he denies a servant of God when he prays? Have you ever seen when he clung firmly to the creed or spoke as a God-fearer? Have you ever seen that he betrayed and turned away? Have you not learned that God sees? Not at all. If he is not given peace, truly he will be seized by his forelock. So call for his high counsel. You will then call up your Lord. Not at all be you, uh, not at all, be you not presumptuous against him, prostrate and approach. And yeah, as we've seen before, when it, when he says or mentions your Lord, that would be a reference to Jesus Christ. And what we can see, this is a hymn. This is supposed to be sung by the congregation. This is not Gabriel talking to Muhammad about some obscure stories that were written down centuries later. Uh, this is for a congregation to be performed. And yeah, and again, the rhymes are what I think really uh, puts home the point, because um, why would those be there? <laughs> um, this, this is too systematic to be random. Um, and yeah, I think this is one of those examples uh, which I want to show you, um, and I hope that helps. <laughs> Let me just give some feedback uh, from what you're saying. Um, yeah, obviously on the left, which is the Quran, on the right is Luling's reinterpretation of the Arabic. When yeah. you look at what Luling has done, it does flow a lot better. It does make sense. It does resonate that the name of the Lord here would be Christ rather than Allah. Because on the left, it's inferred that that would be Allah, the celestial being. Of course. Who of created course, yeah. from a clinging clot, which that's to, to respond to other verses in the Quran that talk about when Adam and Eve were made from a blood clot. In this case, the biblical text, he's created from clay. That's straight back to the Genesis account that he's created from clay. So that would make more sense. Uh, as, you, as you're coming down, I can see some other uh, differences. Who did drag drug by the forelock. Uh, and uh, a lying forelock that has caught that's caused all kinds of problems. People are saying, "What is it? How can a forelock lie?" And I, I remember getting into discussions with this. What Luning is saying: This is by his honor. This is a reference to his yes. honor. It is a Jewish custom, and so this is not a lie. The clock, the the forelock doesn't speak at all. <laughs> that implies it in the Arabic <laughs> of the Quran. So you can see immediately now this makes sense. This is going back to a well understood custom in, in the Jewish co context. And this high, the idea of he let him call to his associates, it's to his high council. That's all the way through the Old Testament. 
uh, then you will call, uh, uh, we, and we call the angels of hell. Uh, no, these are the, they will call up your Lord. So this, I mean, mm. almost in every case, it makes sense. What I think is also really, uh, uh, what is re what is really fascinating is how you say that when you put it into the context of a, like an Aramaic hymn, the, the words do rhyme. And this is the memnonics. And this is one of the reasons they did this is so you can memorize it better. Am I correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Hymn, uh, the Christians do this all the time so that people who would memorize the hymns could memorize it much easier because the ending would all be the rhyming. In the case of the Arabic, it doesn't. So that has been just has distorted and taken away the memnonics that it were there originally. Yeah. And particularly if you don't split them up like Luding did, right? So traditionally, again, verse one is, is longer than what Luding found to be. So there were also some <laughs> errors happening there, I guess. Because people, yeah, that just weren't able to read it correctly anymore once those dots were put in the wrong places. It's interesting that, that verse 16, the lying, sinning forelock is interposed yeah. at a later date. That is not there in the original. That's, that's uh, exactly, that's Luding's conclusion. Um, this, uh, obviously, it doesn't fit in here. It doesn't rhyme with the rest. It, it reads, it's an odd line um, had to be inserted later on. Once, again, once the hymn was already it. lost. Muslims have no way, they have no way, they don't know how to defend this one line that was put in there, and it shouldn't have been put in there because it was not there in the original. <laughs> okay, exactly. listen, the one thing that people are going to ask, and they're saying, okay, Luling has done this, he's done this off the top of his head, he's not following a text in his hand. There is no text that he could point to that's from the 4th, 5th, or 6th that predates the 7th century where this Aramaic is found. Am I correct? Is that correct? Yeah, so th there isn't an Aramaic equivalent to this specific text, but it's the but the, the text itself is sort of in line with Aramaic tradition, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so this is an Arabic text. It's an Arabic text um, according to Günther Lüling, but it follows sort of in the footsteps of earlier hymns. Well, it also follows earlier theology when you're talking about and that, the Lord yeah. is. And who are the the, the those who uh, um, who he has created or how he created it? And who are those who are his associates? These are not. These are the holy hosts of heaven. And also the eye problem with the forelock there, which is uh, uh, by his honor instead of an actual forelock that's lying yeah. on his head. All of these are following earlier traditions and earlier theology and earlier doctrines. Exactly. Yeah. So so we can definitely tell. So, um, the, the evolution of this, right? So it started out in a Christian context. Eventually, the dots were added, but not always um, in the way they were originally intended. And then the original context was lost. So what then happened centuries later when the Sunnah and the Sira was written is an attempt to recreate or to create a new context to kind of make sense of it. Because, yeah, without it, like, you're completely lost. So um, this, I think, um, Gabriel... Um, Reynolds, he's he's making this point that um, all this, these traditions that came later were actually a an attempt at exegesis. Uh, so they they wrote stories to make sense of what was written in the Quran, and those didn't necessarily have to do anything with anything that actually happened. Now let me just put one other to to support this. The read in the name of your Lord, read again the second time. This is this is uh, Gabriel in. Uh, in the Hira cave, is it not, where he says to uh, Muhammad, read, there's the story that imposes that, yes. that this is referring to. Yeah, exactly. So in that sense, uh, in that sense, you can see uh, on the right side where you have the the Aramaic or the, the antecedent to that, invoke the name of your Lord. This is not an imperative that you read now at this point and his his. Yeah. Mind. His response was, I cannot read because he was <laughs> supposedly uh, illiterate. So you can see how 96 has, the, the later narrative has made that into a story of Muhammad in the cave being squeezed by Gabriel three times. And every time says, I cannot read, I cannot read, I cannot read. There is the <laughs> reference that it's pointing to. But it's a great story. It's a great bedtime tale. And it's been used by Muslims <laughs> for 1,400 years to show that this <laughs> is how Muhammad could not be. He could. He was illiterate. Therefore, how could he have, how could he have put together such a beautiful text if he was an illiterate man? 
Exactly. But uh, I agree with uh, Gabriel Said Reynolds that this is probably just um, yeah exegesis after the fact. So trying to make sense of these verses um, by coming up with stories. We would call that eisegesis, the opposite of oh, eisegesis. eisegesis. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> exegesis is when you actually interpret it as the author intended. Eisegesis is when you're imposing your own view on the text. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. So it's an attempt at exegesis, let's put it that way, maybe not so successfully. <laughs> okay, terrific stuff. Now listen, th there will be some people that will question what your interpretation, or uh, sorry, I should say Luling's interpretation. You're just, yeah. you're you're communicating it so we understand it. Thanks so much. It's good to see the red letters there so you can see where the changes have been made, where he's taken either a dot out or he's put a dot in, or he's changed the vowel marks, the Dhamma, the Kastara, or the Fatah. Thank you for doing that. This has been excellent. Because you've given Sa now a very good example of the methodology that Luling has used. So, Thomas, listen, yeah. thanks so much. This is exactly what we're looking yeah. for. This is what people have asked for. There are going to be some comebacks. I'm sure people will want to say, hold on a minute. I want to see the original text. You're not saying that there is that what you have on the right is the original text. This is Luling's working with the text and showing that there's a much easier way to see read it it, it flows much better it fits uh as far as memorization with a memnonics and it looks like this is probably what the original may have looked like uh he's not even saying that this Thank is you. aramaic but it looks like this would be aramaic we're going to see this later in another video that we're coming up with and looking at two references two examples that guillaume d uses uh, looking at surah 23 and surah 70 where he not only takes the dots and the and the vowels out and replaces it with Aramaic dots and vowels. As Guillaume D is uh, this French scholar, he shows you that this what that, that the original is actually a poem from St. Ephraim from the fourth century. So he'll actually take you back to the original poem. So that is a case where there has been it has been plagiarized, except for two verses that have been interposed that absolutely adulterate the text. I would even use the word bastardize the text, but my wife doesn't like me to use that. So I'll say <laughs> with adulteration she's not in the room now so i can get away with it because you can see it absolutely destroys the context of one word called chastity and what it does to the word chastity is just horrendous but anyways that's yet to come thanks so much uh alexander this is or thomas uh this is exactly what we need you've been a real help with us um you've mm -hmm. done you've come and you've really uh, un unblocked an awful lot of what the germans are doing going to learning uh, has is a way ahead of the game and by uh, writing this and putting this together back in the 1970s here we are 50 years later finally understanding it and looking at it in a english context uh you've done us a great favor any last thing you want to say before we end off this episode uh not really no um yeah i mean the thing is you have to, if you want to really go into the details of it you just have to read those books they've written and then i think jay you've done a Great job in your last video where you showed which verses in the Quran Luling tackles. Um, obviously, this can't be all done in one video, but I think that I hope this this example uh, gives a good taste of, of what's going on there. And for those who want to get it, here are the two books. Yeah, uh, this <laughs> is the older one. The yellow one is the older one. There are still a few copies of it. Here is the new edition, and it's because of us that the. The publisher in Delhi has now reprinted just this year. This has just come out just a few months ago because they're running out of copies. They have no more because we have done such a good job or you have done such a good job buying his book. Uh, now, go and get this one because we want to make this a run for his money. We want as many of you to get it in your libraries. And, of course, people like Thomas, uh, Dr. Robert Kerr, will be unpacking it as we see more examples of it. Uh, there's an awful lot yet to be done. But uh, <laughs> it's terrific that we're actually unpacking the Quran, taking it back to its original roots, finding that much of the Quran has been borrowed uh, from these Christian texts. And isn't it interesting that this one here, uh, Surah 96, is all about Jesus? comes back to Jesus, doesn't it? And it makes me proud because I like to get much of the Quran back to its original text where we can see these lectionaries, these hymns, these homilies, all praising Jesus' name. Thanks so much, Thomas. It's great yeah, to have you thank on board. You. We'll see you again. This is Jay and Thomas, thousands of miles apart, over and out. Mm -hmm.